think a little story about Tom, but shall we do it in behind his back? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> He's not here, right? Okay, anyway. So um, let me just start with a, with a setup, and then we'll, we'll turn back to that. So um, X4, always a smooth, oriented, and compact four manifold, closed four manifold. And uh, in trying to understand the, the smooth structure, we associate a function to it, and I, I call it the genus function, G, which maps from the second homology to N by associating to a homology class alpha the minimum of the genera of surfaces which represent alpha. So these are just uh, smooth embeddings of, of x, of sigma, um, such that i lower star of sigma of the fundamental class is exactly alpha. And this is closed and oriented. And we hope that this will somehow detect uh, something about the smooth structure of, of the four manifold. So before proceeding, as you luckily arrive, so <laughs> let me just uh, join Gordana saying that, you know, I met Tom in my mathematical childhood. That was already the adolescent years for, for Tom with all the benefits and uh, complications. Uh, and I always remember him sort of sitting in the back of the lecture hall which somehow changed by now, gravity or something, have to pull him to the front. And, you know, in the back, chatting all the time, <laughs> discussing it. And then you, you uh, I said all the time, you know. <laughs> and then somehow you had the feeling that he doesn't pay any attention. And then towards the end or at the end of the lecture, he just asked the right question. And for me, it was very helpful. And, uh, you know, it helped me to sort of go on and, and gave me program for the next sometimes two days, sometimes two weeks, or even two months to think about and to sort of further develop. So the only thing I can wish for you guys who are younger than me, which is unfortunately a lot of large portion of the audience and it's getting larger and larger for some unknown reason. Um, you know, it's very helpful to have a senior colleague who just ask the right questions and sort of helps you through when you feel stuck. So I'm really grateful and thankful for Tom doing that and uh, so much about his questions. So let's talk a little bit about his answers. So here is, uh, here is one. So let's go back to, to this minimal genus function and we would like to understand it for some manifolds. So the first manifold which might come to your mind is S4. Well, the situation is pretty simple there. This is the zero group, so there is nothing to study. And the next example is CP2, where there is this uh, famous theorem of, of Tom and Peter from 94, the advent of cyber witten theory, which is the Tom conjecture saying that uh, if uh, so how shall I phrase it? Uh, so uh, suppose that H2 CP2, which is isomorphic to Z, generated by the class H, and D is non-zero, then this genus function of CP2 on D times the generator is just D minus one times D minus two over two. So that's the famous Tom conjecture. I was always puzzled the asymmetry, like they solved the Tom conjecture and what did Peter get? So it's not really fair. <laughs> anyway, uh, so this, this uh, completely describes the, the genus function here and there is a generalization of that which we call the symplectic Tom conjecture or generalized symplectic Tom conjecture and this was done by Peter and Zoltan. Uh-huh, like this? 
Anyway, so there is this conjecture. Let me just remind you very quickly. So if we have a symplectic manifold x omega and uh, C is a symplectic submanifold, and sigma is embedded such that the homology class represented by sigma is the same as the one with the symplectic submanifold, then the genus of sigma cannot be less than the genus of the, of the symplectic uh, submanifold. So that's sort of a sharpening that, and it leads already to, to the resolution of, this, uh, of the understanding of the genus function in some cases. Let me just tell you maybe two examples. So the first one is a theorem of, of Danny Ruberman from 95, which describes the, the function for CP2 blown up once. So if x is CP2 blown up once, so the second homology is two-dimensional, and a, a, a random homology class can be described by A times the generator here and B times the generator there, then first of all, we can assume, okay, one remark. This is a diffeomorphism invariant, so meaning that if you apply any kind of diffeomorphism to X, then the, the image of the class will have the same uh, G value as the original one, and we can exploit that symmetry every now and then, and this is what we will do here. So first of all, we can assume that A and B are both positive because there are diffeomorphisms induced by the plus one sphere and the minus one sphere in these two components, and uh, if A is bigger than B, then the genus function of this manifold on AB is given by the following rather simple formula. It's A minus one, A minus two over two minus B minus, no, B times B minus one over two, and you can sort of check this easily because what you do is under this condition, and both are positive, you take CP2, you take B lines passing through the same point, and then the rest of A minus B lines somehow randomly, generically, and then you blow up this point, and you will get a complex surface representing that particular homology class, so appealing to that statement, this gives you a minimal genus, and then a, a simple arithmetic, which I hopefully got right, gives you this answer. Uh, is it important? Well, in this construction it is, but then you realize that this manifold has an orientation reversing diffeomorphism, which gives you x back, and so the same formula works for the case when b is bigger than a, and if a is equal to b, then a little bit of thinking helps you to see that uh, the complex curve is a collection of disjoint spheres and you just tube them together so all these classes can be represented by spheres. So in particular, if uh, A, B, the homology class, the homological square is zero, then the class can be represented by a sphere. Okay, so this really used the, this, this symmetry built in the manifold, and a very similar argument applies when you take S2 cross S2. So the same uh, or similar formula for uh, S2 cross S2. Here again, the two generators are denoted by A and B, and the minimal genus function is given by uh, this simple expression, if a, b is not equal to zero, and when one of them is zero, then again you can represent it by a sphere. Okay, so these are sort of uh, very simple cases, and ma mainly because you have a, a symmetry, and you can reverse the orientation of the manifold. So what happens if we take a slightly more complicated case? So let's consider x to be CP2 blown up twice. So this trick now will not work anymore, and indeed, 
We don't know the answer for the entire function. Let me just tell you one statement we found with Zoltan in this case. So uh, suppose that alpha is a homology class and now the second homology is three-dimensional and I denote by A the component here and B1 and B2 on the two uh, CP2 bar components. And as always, I can assume that they are all, all uh, non-negative. And so here is what, uh, what you can do. So if alpha square is, is non-negative, then you can apply this, uh, these diffeomorphisms generated by embedded plus one, minus one, plus two, minus two spheres, and by a diffeomorphism, you can assume that A is bigger than the sum of the two elements. So say, let me say it again. The original, uh, in the original class, this uh, inequality might not be satisfied, but applying diffeomorphisms right, rightly chosen and not very complicated, you can assume that, which then puts you in the same position as here. So you just take A copies of the projective line, B1 going through this point P, B2 going through the, this point Q, and then the leftover just chosen generically. And so you get a complex curve, you compute the genus after you blow up the two points, and then you get a representative of that class satisfying this condition, uh, which is a complex curve. So we again appeal to the Tom conjecture, the resolution of the Tom conjecture, and we get the minimal genus. The formula is not that nice. It's, it's rather an algorithm together with a formula, and then you get a complete understanding of this case. Uh, a little remark, if alpha square is equal to zero, then uh, that just means that A square is equal to B1 square plus B2 square. So that might ring some bell. You know, these are the Pythagorean triples. And then you run this algorithm and it turns out that the one satisfying this equation will have B1 or B2 equal to zero. So these are very simple uh, classes, and for those, G uh, is equal to zero. So, said differently, in this manifold, similarly to the ones blew up and the product, if you have a homology class with homological square zero, then that can be represented by a sphere. Okay, so this is the first manifold in this sort of growing complexity or growing uh, manifolds growing in size, which we know has an exotic pair. So let me just very quickly remind you how to construct a smooth four manifold, which is homeomorphic to this X, but not diffeomorphic to it. And let's examine for a short time the genus function of that manifold. So, um, so here is a construction of an exotic uh, CP2 blown up twice. So this is due to Akhmedov and Park. And I don't know, maybe 2008, something like that, 2009. And the construction goes as follows. So let's take the zero surgery on the trefoil knot, which gives us a fiber three manifold. It fibers over the circle with fibers the torus. So if I multiply it with S1, I get an oriented four manifold as always, and this fibers over T2 with T2 fibers. So this is a, a torus vibration over, over the torus. We can equip this manifold with a symplectic structure. Symplectic. This needs a little bit of a thinking because typically, Torus fibra uh, surface bundles over surfaces are symplectic, except when the fiber is of genus one, you have to make sure that the fiber is homologically trivial, non-trivial. But in this case, you have a section. So the section will show that the fiber is non-trivial. And indeed, we take a section. So now I will draw, and I hope it will be 
Okay, so this box symbolizes this four manifold, and I take a section, which is a torus of self-intersection zero, and I take another torus, which represents twice the fiber. So it needs a little bit of a braiding, and then I take the two intersection points and blow up one and smooth the other. So blow up and smooth. And if we go through this procedure, what we get is a genus two surface of self-intersection zero inside this manifold uh, blown up once. And the next step is to take this, this gadget and fiber sum with uh, sigma two cross T two. And then there is a little yoga of computing the signature and the Euler characteristic of the resulting four manifold. This is very easy, but unfortunately it will not be simply connected. In fact, it will have very significant B1. The B1 will be four. So on the result, do four, uh, well, I call it Lottinger surgery. to get the manifold which we will denote by AP, Akhmedov Park. So Lottinger surgery is a little bit like Dane surgery, but now one dimension up. So we take a torus with trivial normal bundle, we take it out and we glue it back by a diffeomorphism, which can be characterized by a single curve, like T2 cross D2 is a four manifold, which can be decomposed by having one zero handle, two one handles, and one three ha two handle, and you only have to specify where the two handle goes. So the, the theorem is what they proved. The first is that you can do, you can choose these four tori in a way that what you get at the end is simply connected. And why is it exotic? Well, that's a rather simple uh, observation that the genus function of this manifold when you restrict it to those alphas where, so alpha is in the second homology, this is definitely non-zero. Since you have this genus two surface in here and in there, both are symplectic. It's clear, here, here it's very visible. Here you have to vary a little bit why the, this double is a symplectic, but it's not very complicated. So you have a, a genus two surface which is symplectic, so it minimizes genus in its homology class. So it's a, the, the function is definitely not constant zero, so it differs, the, the four manifold differs from, from, the, from CP2 blown up twice. So this is kind of a lesson to learn. You know, at the current state of techniques, to show that they are not diffeomorphic is pretty easy. We have all those theorems and they just give it for free, essentially, to show that it's simply connected, well, that's a challenge. You know, you have to use the von Kampen theorem, which you taught to your students many, many times, told them to be careful about the base point, and then you are not careful about the base point. So, you know. Um, okay, so, um, so here I give you a, sort of complete description of squares, positive squares, or non-negative squares. What, happened with ne what happens with negative squares? Well, we know much less. cyber witten theory does not really help directly in understanding the minimal genus of negative squared homology classes. We have to look for other tools. There are other tools, but they give you only partial results, like bounds on the genus. Such tool, for example, if alpha happens to be a characteristic class, so the complement is spin, then you try to sort of glue to another spin manifold and apply the, the tenet conjecture, the tenet theorem of Ruta, and get some understanding of the possible minimal genus. You cannot expect a sharp result because we don't expect the tenet conjecture to be sharp. So these are bounds which tell you some restrictive cases, alpha should be characteristic, so you can exclude them to be uh, spheres, for example. The same strategy works in, in the AP manifold, of course, because it only uses homological arguments. 
Here you know a little more because the cyber witnessing variants of the AP manifold are non-zero. So you have an adjunction formula, not only for classes with non-negative square, but also for negative ones coming from the same paper of, of Peter and Zoltan. So we know, we know a little more, but we don't know the exact uh, shape of this function. And it would be very interesting to see because this manifold does not come by itself. So we have these four Lottinger surgeries, which we can do in a way that the result is symplectic. But also, we can sort of tweak one of those to get an infinite family of, uh, of exotic structures where the, the exoticness is reflected by the value of the cyber witten function, not by the configuration of basic classes. The basic classes will be the same, but the value is different. The function takes on them. And we have presently no idea how this value influences the genus function. So it would be nice to see. Um, and uh, well, I'm waiting for the right question from Tom to proceed with that. Um, so here is a little conjecture we have. So we spent a lot of time trying to find a sphere in this AP. And we didn't. So what do you do if you don't find something? You think that it doesn't exist. So conjecture, AP does not contain a homologically essential uh, embedded sphere. I have no good argument why this should be true. And the only foundation of, of stating this is because we didn't find any. Uh, speaking of which, you know, it's always a, a nice uh, question to, to try to understand spheres in four manifolds. And let me quote another old question. So um, um, spheres in the K3 surface. So a very simple-minded question is, what is the most negative number we can present as the self-intersection of, of a sphere in K3? So here is the, the current. Uh, best result. This goes back to Finashian and Mihalkin. 97, that there is a sphere in the K3 surface such that the self intersection is minus 86. And we tried to beat that. We couldn't. Let me give you a construction how to find a very negative sphere in the K3 surface. So first of all, what is the K3 surface? So here is one construction. You take S2 cross S2, and you take four copies of the vertical and four copies of the horizontal uh, S2, and you take the double-branched cover. It's an even class, so you can consider the double-branched cover. This is a singular curve, so the result will be sing a singular four-manifold. And either you resolve it, or you make the following trick. First, you get rid of the singularities by blowing them up. So let's blow up all these intersection points. There are 16 of them. So we get S2 cross S2 blown up 16 times. And take the proper transforms of these eight curves and take the double branch cover along them. Well, what you get, you have to take my word for it. That's the K3 surface. And I also. Would like you to, uh, I would like to invite you to see a lot of spheres in that, in that manifold, namely every branch curve, after the blow up, it will become a minus four sphere. And when you take the double branched cover branched along this curve, it will become a minus two sphere. The, the, the exceptional divisors of the blow ups, these are minus one spheres, and they are branched in two points where they intersect the the branch locus, so they will also become minus two spheres. And I claim that these four, horizontal, the four vertical guys will give you four copies of minus two spheres which intersect each other like this. So there are four of these 
crosses, 20 homology classes altogether. We take one more class here. This will also become a minus two sphere. So they are joined by this last one. So altogether you have, you know, there are the crosses. Altogether we have 21 minus two spheres. And if you smooth the intersections by the appropriate orientations, this will give you a minus 82 sphere. Well, not as good as, the, as this theorem, but it's pretty close. And let me just point out that what do we really need, use here? Well, we construct a very specific vibration over the K3 surface. So if we go to this Lefschetz vibration story and we analyze the monodromy, the total monodromy of the of the uh, elliptic vibration is AB to the 12. And what we did here, we just portioned it, partitioned it into four equal pieces. So we just took this decomposition. So I'm saying that 12 is equal to three times four. So it's pretty, it's, it's, it checks, okay? Well, and now comes the trick. Because 12 is also AB to the four to the cube, and this gives you a very similar curve configuration with 22 curves, and this will give you minus 86. So you can improve by, by playing around with a little bit with the, with the uh, factorization, and this led us to the following uh, construction. So, uh, so this is a proposition. Again, this I worked that with, with Zoltan last year. And so it just says that if we take the elliptic surface En, then it has an embedded sphere of self-intersection. And then there is this silly formula minus 44.2 times n plus 4 over 5, 5 minus r, where r is the mod 5 residue of n. So r is, is, a, is an integer between 0 and 4 and determined by n. So this just recovers minus 86 in the, for the k3 and gives you other examples of, of this uh, this uh, self-intersection. And this led us to the following question, conjecture, that for every x, smooth four manifold as before, with non-trivial cyber witten invariance, and as always, b2 plus bigger than one, so sorry, there is a c, there is a universal constant c, such that for every x, uh, and an embedded sphere, we have that the self-intersection of S is at least uh, C times the second Betty number of X. And so at this stage, after trying to prove or disprove or do something with that question, the best C we found was uh, minus five. So we don't really know. Again, there is this problem with negative self-intersection surfaces, very little uh, tools we can use again for characteristic classes. We can do the, this fiber summing because the complement becomes spin. If it's some, um, even multiple of a, or, or two power multiple of a characteristic class, we can take branched covers and again apply the 10-8 theorem or use the 11-8 theorem for gases. But this does not apply for every homology class. But whenever it does, it sort of verified this, uh, this question. Um, okay, so, um, so here is the next manifold which is a little more Challenging. So let's consider two CP2. 
So we sort of out of the realm of, of uh, holomorphic geometry or, or symplectic. So it's like CP2 connected some CP2. Yes. So there is a constant that for every x, and whenever you have an s, then it should satisfy. Yeah. So here again, the homologies are represented by two um, integers. And that is the, the obvious bound. So the genus of AB to CP2 is definitely less than what you get from CP2, like the, the most simple-minded A minus 1, A minus 2 over 2. Once again, I assume that A and B are both uh, positive. I was thinking to call the two components kr and mr, but then I decided it's silly, so I don't do it. Um, <laughs> I tried. Um, yeah, so, um, so the, the, this, you know, if you have to bet, you would say that this will never hold. I mean, that's, that's too simple-minded. And it turns out that it's not completely true. So once again, using this branched cover um, and spin 10-8 uh, conjecture, 10-8 theorem trick, there is a paper of Jim Bryan which shows that the, this uh, bound uh, gives the right answer for the class 3-3 three, three and 6-6. Six, six. So sometimes for very low numbers, somehow the difference between the 10-8 and the 11-8 does not really come into effect. And you might be lucky to get something like that. Um, and we know that this cannot always hold. So for example, we can take the class 3-0 and this can be represented by a fishtail in the first component and two lines in the second, but one of them comes with a positive and the other with the negative orientation, so somehow in homology they cancel, and so the local picture is just the, the mirror image of each other, so you just tube them together and you get a genus zero representative of that class. But in general, it's a, it's a pretty challenging uh, problem to actually give estimates for, for the, the genus. So in a project with uh, Marco Marangon, we found the following. So here is a little proposition. Uh, so it says that if we have the genus function on two uh, classes, again, I assume that A and B are both uh, non-negative, this is always less than we take the usual kronheimer morovka formula for both, and we can subtract a term which looks like this under the assumption that A and B have the same parity. And, uh, and well, you know, this only becomes interesting if A is much larger than B. If, if A is a little bigger, so I always assume that A is bigger than B. If it's only a little bigger, then somehow this doesn't uh, give any sharper bound. But if it is much bigger, for example, we take the classes twice a, an odd number two. In this case, the bound of, of Jim applies. It's twice a characteristic class. Um, it gives a, an expression in terms of P. It's a quadratic uh, a, a, expression with some leading term. This formula gives another quadratic expression with another leading term. And or bound uh, sort of lowers the upper bound by a linear term. So we don't really touch the essence, the, the difference in the, in the leading uh, coefficients. But it shows that there is a room to, to improve. Um, OK, so well, I started with an example of S4 or this genus bound story, and, and then we just slipped through that, and I said that you know, none of these apply, so we have to sort of improve or approach a little bit. And here is an idea to include S4.
So, so uh, for x as before, consider the four manifold m, which sometimes we denote by x circle, which is just x minus the four handle, the interior of the four handle. So this becomes now a four manifold with non-trivial boundary, the boundary is S3, and then we can associate to it the slice genus function, which goes from the set of knots in S3 to the natural numbers, and then it sends a knot to the minimum of, uh, you know, the, the slice genus in X, in, in M. And again, C infinity and embedding. So we can somehow refine this, uh, this search for surfaces when we have a boundary, then we allow to inter the surface to have non-trivial boundary, it should uh, pr be properly embedded, and we just fix how it should intersect the boundary. And uh, so what can we say about this function? Well, there are a few very simple statements. So for example, it's very easy to see that for S2 cross S2, this is just the constant zero function because we represent, we, I just draw a Kirby diagram for, for S2 cross S2. Once you give, give me a knot K, so here is your knot K, and then it needs a little bit of a thinking that what you get is actually S2 cross S2, and you attach a two handle along the knot K, so that will be my slice disk. And the same applies for CP2, connected some CP2. So for these manifolds, this is pretty simple. It's more complicated if you ask the same question for CP2. So for, uh, for CP2, this function is unbounded. This is a little note we prepared with uh, Aru Ray and Alison Miller and, and Marco Marangon. Um, what happens with a really heavy four manifold, like a K3 surface? For K3, well, there, there were, there, this question was sort of floating around for a while now, and here is the, the latest uh, I know about. So there is this theorem of Marco and a student of mine, that if the unknotting number of the knot is at most 21, then this, uh, this value is zero. So every knot is sliced if the unknotting number is less than 21. So from practical purposes, under any other circumstances, I would say that these are all the knots. I mean, you don't know any knot, which is, you know, like, but uh, this 20 knot is, 21 is very suspicious. If you remember the configuration I was drawing here, it had exactly 21 uh, nodes, and there was an improvement which has 22. So somehow it's very much attached to the second homology of K3. And so this is exactly what their argument uses. So maybe in order to go from 21 to 31 or something, a genuinely new idea is needed. So still, I wouldn't write this problem off. Um, Okay, um, so I'm still not at, at S4, so let's, let's do that. So let me, any question? The homological S, no, they're just floating around. They can be, so sliceness. And then there are all variants, like you fix the homology class or you fix it to be H slice, where you require this F to be homologically uh, inessential, uh, in and then you can do much more, and I will leave it for the, the competent person to enlighten us about that. Um, but what happens if, if uh, you, know, you don't have any homology? So suppose that M is a potentially exotic D4. 
So that's the real question in the, in the story, whether these exist or not. So let me give you two definitions. So the first is that uh, M is small if M embeds into D4 and large otherwise. So the terminology is borrowed from the story of exotic R4s. Similarly, uh, so like R4s, uh, similarly put into two categories. And let me just uh, denote by SM the set of slice links uh, in, in M. So, so far I always at, uh, stuck, stuck to, to nodes, but now assume that we are taking all the links and uh, a link is slice if every component bounds a disk and these disks are disjoint from each other. So in particular, the linking numbers are all zero. Um, okay, so here are two statements we proved in this case. So, so this is a work I did with uh, Alberto Cavallo. And so we claim the following. So if M is small, then the corresponding set of slice links should be the same as for D4. First, and if M is large, and not only simply connected, but geometrically simply connected, so it has a handle decomposition without one handles, so geometrically simply connected, then S is of M is strictly bigger than S of D4. So this is the last statement I would like to finish with, but I would like to give two remarks. So the first one is that what is really a small uh, exotic D4? Well, this would provide a counterexample to the Schoenflies conjecture. The Schoenflies conjecture states that if you have an S3 embedded in S4 smoothly, then one side should be the regular D4. And this would give a counterexample to that. So the, the, the first line suggests that don't try to prove your potential counterexample to the Schoenfli's conjecture by sliceness of knots, right? By, by this, because you will get, this has to be the same. So this is a fairly simple argument. Um, the next one is sort of, you know, I was thinking how to call the, the, the links living in the difference. So these are the Obi-Wan knots. You know, these are our only hopes. So if you want to prove exoticness along these lines, those are the only hopes. And uh, so what do we need? So first of all, we need examples like that. And we have to detect that they are not in S of D4. So we do need further refined link invariants, which are probably not coming from gauge theory because they tend to behave the same for exotic D4s than for D4s. So Kovanov, Kovanov type, kovanov Rosansky, something like that should be useful in this case. And let me make a final uh, remark about this assumption. So what do we expect? So for a closed manifold, it's an open question whether simple connectivity implies geometrically simply, simple connectivity. So if you have a closed four manifold, which is simply connected, can you present it with, without one handles? We don't know. What happens if we have a manifold with boundary? Well, if the boundary is not S3 and the manifold is contractible, then there is an argument of Casson saying that they are never geometrically simply connected. You always need a, a, a one handle. So it's up to us to decide whether a manifold with S3 boundary behaves like a closed manifold or a manifold with boundary. I could make an argument for both, but uh, that doesn't spare us from trying to find such examples and then trying to find the Obi-Wan link. And then maybe at some good day, we might find an exotic S4. So until then, I think I'm stopping here. Yes.
Yes. So that's a, yeah, so there is an upscaled version of, of this, the, the function, and then, the, of course, for links, there are various notions of slice genus, and it just says that it's hopeless. And maybe, you know, maybe the Schoenflies conjecture is true. I don't know, but there is this option. For the Poincaré, I would not bet. Yeah, so this one, so wh where, where do we use that? So, like, I tell you what, what, what is the guy, what's, who is Obi-Wan. Uh, well, you take a, a handle decomposition, and there are no one handles, so the attaching circles of the two handles are exactly the, and then the argument is a little longer, but this, this is what you would like to show, that those not, th th that link is not slice in the regular disk. Yes? This one? Yes. No. Otherwise, I would tell you, right? No. <laughs> Unfortunately, they, this is like so close. But uh, of course, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to be extremely lucky because the lower bounds, as the numbers are starting to grow, so here is 3, 3, 6, 6, the, the lower bound gets weaker and weaker in a sense of what do you really expect because you can use the 10-8 and we expect the 11 to be true. But even if we assume the 11 we didn't get a single example where this is sharp. That's very sad. Any other ideas? Uh, no. Lower bound, no. Do we? For, for A, B, for in general? So, no, you know, you, you can try tau or all kinds of these invariants, and, uh, and uh, they might, ex or Kovanov homology, and uh, there is nothing I could say. Yeah. No. It would be nice. What does the surface look like? So the standard diagram is this, right? And so what we do is, so you, ex, you, you consider CP2 without a forehandle. And we would like to put a, a knot here such that the knot will be sort of, it will be a connected sum of two knots. And one of them will be sliced on one side and then we have an estimate on the, on the, uh, on the genus on the other side and this is a slice knot in D4, so you can sort of finish it off. And I will just tell you the knot, and then I will not tell you how they are related to the, to the circles. Then the knot is uh, n, n minus one, connected sum with its mirror. So the one, a negative torus knot and the, and the same positive torus knot, clearly it bounds a disk up here, and the, you know, this plus one can be used to introduce all the negative twists, and then so this, is a, this will be a disk, and the other one, you have to suffer a little bit to, to position this plus one nicely so that you gain a little bit of a genus. So that's roughly the, the, the idea. N, N, a minus one, or N, N plus one, I don't remember. Well, I didn't tell you what N is, so that's an old trick. 